Доброго дня. Good afternoon, dear ladies and gentlemen. Ukraine Crisis Media Center starts its day with the topic of legal assessment of um, um, events in Crimea uh, under Russian occupation. Now I give the floor to our moderator, Maria Tomak. She will moderate our discussion today. Good afternoon, dear colleagues. Sorry for this technical delay. I would like to say that today we have a really important event. We do not have speakers in press center, but I know that we have uh, journalists who came to this briefing. They are in press center, and I'm grateful for your interest. And I would like to say that uh, if you have additional interest um, to our briefing to speakers, you may speak with them separately. When George uh, is in Kiev, you may speak with him anytime. Uh, and Mikola Gavaruha, he is also in Kiev, and uh, also our colleague from the Netherlands, you may speak with her online. She joined us from Amsterdam. Now about briefing itself. Overall context is like this. Actions that are ongoing in the uh, district court in The Hague. Uh, these actions are important for Ukrainian society, for international community, and Ukrainian media, Ukrainian press follow these events. But at the same time, we feel lack of some professional expert assessment of international experts different views on this process concerning strategic and legal things and uh, in accordance with international law. And uh, today's event uh, will propose such views. At the same time, we would like to speak about this topic concerning qualifications of those events that are ongoing in Ukraine, qualification of war. We all understand that this war is also the war for the truth. Starting 2013, especially at the level of, at the international level, there are different views that are expressed concerning the level of involvement of Russian Federation. If in Ukrainian legislation everything is rather clearly defined that we have occupied territories in Crimea and in separate uh, uh, regions of Donetsk and Lugansk Oblast, if you are speaking about international assessment, there are different views on this. So the view of the world is not so unanimous as we would like it to be. In order to explain this problem and to tell how international group global rights compliance will try to help us to correct the situation, now I'd like to give the floor. Uh, to my colleague Wayne Chordas. Before this, I would like to say that on the whole, we have uh, three participants of the briefing. Uh, Wayne Chordas, uh, managing partner of International um, Human Rights Protection Group Global Rights Compliance. Marek Dehun, um, associate professor at the chair of international law, uh, international criminal law and uh, human rights in uh, um, the Free University of Amsterdam, and I will tell you later why we invited her to participate in this uh, briefing uh, to comment on uh, the actions of the uh, in uh, the Hague. And also, we are joined by Mikola Gavaruha, deputy um, head of department at uh, uh, the. Um, Ministry of Occupied Territory. So, um, in order not to take too much time, I would like to give the floor to Wayne Jordash. Thank you very much, Maria. And um, I'm uh, happy to be able to uh, address uh, the media center and to the public at large about this important issues of classification. Just to um, step back a bit and introduce myself, my name is Wayne Jordash, as Maria said. I'm the managing partner of Global Rights Compliance, which is an organization of international lawyers 
which has, um, amongst other projects, been working in Ukraine since 2016. Uh, we've been trying to support the government, uh, particularly the Prosecutor General's Office and also a civil society, principally in seeking accountability for core international crimes, uh, which are suspected of uh, being committed in Crimea and in Donbass. In relation to these uh, difficult challenges, um, Ukraine really has um, a task at hand. It is not easy. Some of those challenges are obvious. Um, Ukraine has little or no access to Crimea and little or no access to Donbass. These are um, facts which make investigation and prosecution of international crimes very difficult. In addition to that, and of course related, is the fact that Ukraine has little or no access to those suspected of involvement in violations of international uh, law. Despite these many challenges, Ukraine's government and civil society have, um, with skill and determination, engaged a range of international justice mechanisms including the International Criminal Court, the International Court of Justice, the European Court of Human Rights, and of course, proceedings pursuant to the United Nations Convention on the Laws of the Sea. So challenges, uh, but skillful action on behalf of Ukraine. Nonetheless, despite this skillful lawfare, Ukraine still suffers from a number of considerable challenges which relate uh, directly to the classification of the armed conflicts in both Crimea and Donbass. And this is a significant challenge. Whilst Ukraine has obtained a degree of political support, as Maria outlined in her introduction, for the government, for the Ukraine government's claim that Crimea is occupied, this support is now beginning to erode at the General Assembly level. Back in 2014, when Russia's involvement in Ukraine was new, the UN General Assembly determined a resolution with 100 votes in favor, 11 against, and 58 abstentions, determining that Russia had violated the territorial integrity of Ukraine and through unlawful force had seized Crimea. As Ukraine knows, uh, the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe stripped Russia of their right to vote in the Assembly as a consequence of that resolution. However, as Ukraine will also be aware, five years later, Russia has now been allowed to rejoin PACE. Despite not meeting any of the Council of Europe's demands, in effect, support for the proposition that Russia had seized Crimea illegally has significantly eroded over the last six years. UN Resolution 74168 of 2020 uh, was adopted, but now with only 65 votes to 23 against and 83 abstentions. Meanwhile, the status of Donbass remains on the international uh, level somewhat of a controversial issue. Whilst the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe refers to Donbass as the, quote, temporarily occupied territories in Donetsk and Lugansk, other international organizations, such as the OSCE and the UN, do not label the state of affairs as an occupation. Why is this important? These political declarations, what the international community labels, um, what labels they use to describe Crimea and Donbass matters hugely to Ukraine. Of course it does. On the most critical questions concerning Ukraine's territorial and sovereignty claims against Russia, the international community seems more and more divided. These questions concern critical questions such as, is Russia, as a matter of international law, an occupier in Crimea? Two, is the conflict, conflict in Donbass a non-international armed conflict, an international armed conflict, or both? Related to that question, of course, is, is Russia 
Russia an occupying force in Donbass? Does it have overall control of the non-state armed groups that uh, occupy that territory? These are critical questions. They're not optional inquiries. Notwithstanding the critical nature of these questions, uh, so far, they have not been answered in the legal arena. This, at least in part, explains why political support at the international level is eroding. What is needed, in, in my view, is an impartial expert legal opinion which addresses these questions, looks at all the facts, looks at the law and addresses what is the applicable international law, what is Russia's involvement in Crimea, what is Russia's involvement in Donbass, and comes to some decisive and authoritative views. Now, ordinarily, of course, um, in an ideal world, at least, these questions would be answered by an international court, um, a court which uh, could consider these questions, consider all the evidence from 2014 until now, now and come to uh, rulings which would be accepted internationally and accepted by both uh, Russia and Ukraine. Unfortunately, that's not um, likely to happen in the near future. I mentioned earlier, Ukraine has, of course, interacted with the International Criminal Court. It filed declarations and accepted the jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court. The International Criminal Court will, in due course, consider many of these questions. But as we all know, the International Criminal Court, however um, necessary it is, it works very slowly. It will not determine some of these critical questions for perhaps seven to 10 years. The same goes for other uh, international mechanisms which Ukraine has used. As you know, Ukraine has um, uh, issued proceedings at the International Court of Justice. Notwithstanding, it has been constrained by jurisdictional issues. The International Court of Justice will not consider the overall question of whether, for example, Russia is in control of the non-state armed groups in Donbass. The European Court of Human Rights comes a bit more close to considering some of these questions, but even the European Court of Human Rights, which will consider issues of control in Donbass, they will con consider issues of control in Donbass only in relation to specific time-bound alleged conduct. And so Ukraine cannot, unfortunately, rely upon the international courts to be able to consider these questions in the very near future or in most cases, not at all. And so Ukraine faces uh, a real challenge in having these questions considered and ruled upon in an authoritative and impartial manner. As I say, these questions are not optional questions, they're essential questions. The Uk Uk Ukrainian government needs an accurate understanding of Russia's responsibility for the harm done in Crimea, for the harm done in Donbass. It needs an accurate understanding of responsibility to inform the Minsk peace negotiations or design a transitional justice plan or simply to seek accountability and redress for its citizenry. The same applies in relation to Ukrainians' civil society. If civil society is to lobby and promote essential accountability and redress for the affected communities, including those who have suffered from gross violations of international humanitarian and human rights law, then a clear description of international law and a clear description of the violations is required. That's what we're talking about when we talk about classification. Moreover, and as importantly, perhaps, support from the international community must be based on the applicable international law. That requires classification. If Ukraine is to lobby international partners to be able to keep up the pressure, to be able to make its points internationally, then it must have a classification of the conflict. Classification which involves addressing these critical questions. Only then can Ukraine can lobby for UN General Assembly resolutions. 
Only then can it obtain effective diplomatic measures or individual restrictive measures against Russia, such as asset freezes and travel restrictions or sanctions of different types. If Ukraine wants to lobby for continued restrictions on economic relations with Crimea, then it must have details of uh, the law that applies and the classification of the conflict and so on. This is um, just a short brief outline of why classifying this conflict remains both a challenge, a challenge that must be met, and a challenge which is absolutely essential to the long-term future of Ukraine and any durable peace process and peace agreement that is met in the next few years. Um, as um, Maria said when she introduced me, one of the biggest battles uh, Ukraine faces is the battle of truth. If Ukraine wishes to fight that battle, then it needs classification of the conflict. For all the reasons I've said, but also to ensure that truth is not the casu casualty of this war, but truth, the truth of the conflict, the truth of who did what, forms the basis of any future and sustainable peace. Thank you. Thank you, Wayne. Власне кажучи, thank you. It is really important to speak about classification. The role of Russia should be identified properly, and also issues of occupation should be identified clearly. Also, uh, the situation in the court in the Hague. This is an important process at the international level, and I believe that a lot of attention of Ukrainian media was paid to the prosecutor's office. Uh, there were some hints about the character of the conflict. There were many quotes and uh, many comments on this, and I believe it is important to look at this court process and speak about its potential of its influence, how the international community views the war in Ukraine, whether the international community is ready to uh, call things by their own name and uh, whether the process in the Netherlands may influence on all those uh, court cases, all those declarations that are in international courts. The European Court on Human Rights, uh, international uh, UN Court, several um, cases were filed, international criminal courts, so these are three main, uh, the most important uh, um, court uh, courts and uh, maybe, uh, and also the process in the Netherlands is important, and uh, they, uh, these court hearings uh, will be uh, really of value. So our next speaker is uh, Marika de Hoon. She is Associate Professor at Amsterdam University, and maybe the main is that on the request of the deputies of the uh, um, uh, the parliament, uh, Marike, followed um, the uh, court hearings on MH17, and she comments actively on these processes in the media concerning international humanitarian law, and also she spoke in the parliament as an expert who followed this event, this process. And she has great expertise, and we invited her in order that she express her opinion during our press conference. Please tell us about this process and how it can influence on qualification of the war in Ukraine in other courts, international courts, where Ukraine addresses in order to bring its truth to the international level. Uh, thank you, Maria, for that introduction. And I'm happy here to um, exchange some views on the ongoing MH17 trial in the Netherlands and how this relates to 
other legal proceedings um, and the situation in Eastern Ukraine. Um, so first uh, to start out with, maybe not give a little bit of a background on where we are at now with the MH17 trial in the Netherlands. Uh, because the status, the question of the status of the conflict in Eastern Ukraine may come up in this Dutch criminal case, but doesn't necessarily have to. The prosecution has argued that it's not necessary to discuss the status of the armed conflict as either international or national or hybrid, or both uh, for the court uh, to rule in this case. But uh, this is up to the court. And I'll explain a little bit more later. Uh, so first, where are we in the case? Um, the case has started in March and it is still in a preliminary phase. So it hasn't come to the merits, to actually arguing the substance. So the conversations, the, the um, uh, arguments so far are about um, preliminary aspects such as and particularly about the investigations and what investigations the prosecution has done and wants to do more. And this week on Monday and Tuesday, we saw the defense starting their submissions on what investigations they want to have done. So in order to have a fair trial that they say, well, there are certain, and this is their argument in the last couple of days, they say there are still alternative scenarios that the prosecution has argued that can be excluded because they are, um, uh, the prosecution says there is enough evidence to show that it's not a credible scenario. And these are particularly two scenarios where the defense has said, we disagree and we want more investigations. And that is that the possible scenario that there was no book missile at all, but that it was a Ukrainian warplane and that Ukraine has covered this up. So they say, we're not arguing that this happened. We just need more information. We need more investigations in order to understand, to, to lawfully exclude this as a scenario. And then they also submitted that or if it were a book missile, uh, then um, we are not convinced that there's enough evidence that this isn't a Ukrainian book missile. So they also say that that scenario is still plausible. And if other alternative scenarios are plausible, they can then argue in the future when it is about the merits that therefore the line of argumentation of the prosecution that it would have been a book missile uh, from uh, uh, Russian making um, shot from by the armed groups in eastern Ukraine, that that is not proven sufficiently. So that has been their defense strategy in the last uh, two days. Um, and the rest were really, um, uh, it's, this is going to take a long time, uh, this uh, trial, um, uh, because we're only still in the preliminary phase. Um, they will continue next week, uh, so they'll continue on, on Friday and then also next week. And then by 3 July, the court will make rulings on what of these investigation requests into these alternative scenarios um, they will allow and what not. Um, and so before we actually will go to the merits, namely the four individuals that are accused, uh, what are they exactly accused of and what is that? what is can be proven about that it'll be uh late in 2020 or maybe even 2021 so this will take uh, quite some time now the question of the status of the conflict um so this is relevant whether the armed conflict was an international armed conflict or a non-international armed conflict or both is relevant um uh, for the qualification of international crimes that may have been committed in Eastern Ukraine, so war crimes. Uh, but according to the Dutch prosecution, this is not relevant for the cases against these four accused because they are tried for murder and for downing a plane, not for war crimes. So they're tried for, they're prosecuted for common Dutch crimes, crimes that are also uh, criminal in dom any domestic legal order, including the Ukrainian or the Russian. Um, the question of the status of armed conflict is, in principle, however, relevant for the question of combatant immunity. And this means that the prosecution is saying, in case the defense will argue this, and the defense has said, we may argue this, that the argument of combatant immunity would be, and the defense, when we're talking about the defense, it is only for Pulatov. So Pulatov has sent 
trial lawyers and the others have not. So the three other cases are in absentia, which is a possibility in Dutch criminal law, but Pulitov has sent lawyers. So the Pulitov defense has said, maybe we want to argue combatant immunity, which would imply that they say the case is not admissible against Pul Pulitov because he as military or someone that was protected by the Geneva Conventions um, can't be tried in a foreign domestic court. Now the prosecution has laid out their argument in case the defense will argue this, this does not apply. And in principle, one of the questions, one of the criteria that are relevant is the status of the armed conflict as international or non-international. And so the court would then have to rule on this. But what the prosecution is saying is that the court, in their opinion, doesn't even have to go there because they say there are many other criteria that um, the armed groups and the accused need to uh, adhere to. And since those criteria already fail, the, the, the question of combatant immunity wouldn't apply at all anyway. So why not just skip over the question of determining the status as an international armed conflict or non-international? So it'll be now up to the courts to uh, decide themselves whether they want to engage with this, but first, of course, to the defense, whether or not they're really going to argue this. And the main point that the prosecution is making in this is that from the criteria that are important to get this combatant status, combatant privilege, is that they say they have committed so many crimes, the armed groups um, uh, have committed so many crimes, particularly the DPR, um, that are in violation of the laws of armed conflict. And also the downing of MH17 in and of itself is not in accordance with the laws of armed conflict. And so therefore they would not even be able to invoke the combatant immunity even if uh, other criteria would apply. So in that line of reasoning, you've seen the prosecution being quite fierce, um, not quite, extremely uh, um, uh, strongly worded um, uh, in accusing the DPR uh, and the military forces of uh, committing all sorts of crimes in their uh, area, but also against Russia um, and Russia's involvement. Uh, and you see that um, they were very strong in uh, arguing also the link of Russia with the armed groups, saying that Russia was involved, is involved, but also was involved for uh, when MH17 was downed uh, by uh, all sorts of manners, including providing uh, military materials, uh, but also recruiting and financing fighters, um, and all sorts of um, operational manners as well. And these aspects that the prosecution is arguing are relevant also for other potential international court cases. Um, it would be more relevant if the court actually makes a decision on aspects like that and whether or not they will do so really depends on what the defense is going to argue. And so whether they really have to and then if they don't really have to, then still you see also in cases that it will be relevant to see whether a court wants to. So we'll have to wait and see how that develops in the months and years to come. Now, in principle, um, on the question of how can this case influence uh, other international court cases, the, the strictly legal answer to that is, in principle, not. Um, any ruling of a Dutch criminal court is not binding on any other court, foreign court, international court. However, it is seen as authoritative, especially in a criminal court case where evidence is produced transparently and argued, and the defense has the fair trial rights to counter argue this evidence. And then when a court says in a, in, a, in a court of law that is respected and that is also scrutinized for human rights appliance, for instance, by the European Court of Human Rights, if that court then comes to a ruling that certain aspects have happened and that Russia is involved in, in certain ways um, itself and through uh, supporting the armed groups, this has a huge or potentially a huge uh, authoritative value in these other proceedings. Um, then, so, and, and I can answer uh, any question about this, but I see that my time is running out. And maybe as a final comment on um, this case, this MH17 case, what strikes 
um, what, what stands out really in this case is that it is a domestic criminal court proceedings in the Netherlands, in a normal sort of criminal case scenario. But nothing about this is, of course, normal. It's, it's hugely um, sensitive and internationalized. And the, the, the aspect that stands out most in that is the way that geopolitics seem to be transformed into legal arguments in that domestic court of criminal law, particularly by the prosecution raising Russia's role in a number of contexts that they submit is relevant for this criminal proceedings. So saying uh, a, a lot of things about the credibility of Russia's claim that certain evidence would not be reliable uh, by submitting that Russia has tried to undermine the investigations, provided false information and therefore lost its credibility uh, with the consequence that they say, they argue, the prosecution, that the court therefore should be very reluctant in believing Russia's statement on the validity of, of certain aspects of evidence but also on, and I refer to this already, the linkages between Russia and the armed group uh, fighting in uh, Donetsk and Luhansk uh, to thereby demonstrate Russia's involvement uh, and possible liability of Russia for failing to prevent uh, the commission of crimes by the armed groups. Um, so we'll see what, has to ha what happens around these aspects and to what extent the court will be um, wanting to say much about that. And on the other side, you also see the ge geopolitics um, uh, coming in into light with uh, the defense uh, particularly arguing uh, that Ukraine's failure um, or alleged failure to close the airspace could have had the effect that the armed groups believed they were not taking a serious risk for shooting down a civilian aircraft if they believed that the airspace was closed. We have to see how um, uh, sound that argument is when they really start arguing it. Uh, or so they also indicated that they might argue that Ukraine was otherwise involved, for instance, through the scenario that it was a Ukrainian warplane that shot down MH17 and that Ukraine has tried to um, cover this up and thereby also making the statement that uh, the Netherlands may have cooperated in this cover up. So here you see that um, geopolitics enter in many different ways in this criminal court proceedings in then the form of legal arguments, and that even though this is a criminal case against four accused, one of which has sent a defense, um, that a lot of this is indeed about um, the conflict in uh, Eastern Ukraine and the way that it is being fought and the role of Russia in it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Maria, for this comprehensive um, speech. Um, as we see, we do not have clear idea about the character of this conflict, whether it is international or not, and the uh, participation of the Russian Federation, and how it will influence uh, further court hearings that were initiated by Ukraine in the international courts, and also how this process will influence other proceedings uh, that uh, were started by Ukraine uh, concerning events in Donbass. I would like to give the floor uh, to Mikola Gavaruha, Deputy Head of the Department of um, uh, Oversight and Information um, uh, at the Office of uh, Prosecutor General of Ukraine. Uh, we ask you to comment on what ad, other speakers said and how this process influences other processes. And on the whole, about legal qualification of occupation. So we would like to ask you about Donbass and uh, those territories that are occupied. Uh, good afternoon. About your first question, unfortunately, I cannot comment. I cannot say that I agree with the arguments of Marika or that I don't agree with them. 
because uh, agreement of joint investigative group that is composed of several countries, including uh, Ukraine and the government of the Netherlands, that deal with investigation of uh, MH17, it limits all the representatives of Ukraine except uh, the Netherlands part concerning the comments uh, on uh, legal uh, uh, on uh, uh, court hearings. And uh, uh, this is for ethical reasons. Me, as a prosecutor, I cannot provide comments on the prosecution and defense, and uh, I believe I cannot comment on the def decisions of the court. And those colleagues that followed the uh, uh, court hearing this Monday, they maybe understand why I cannot comment on this. About your second question, about proper qualification of the armed co conflict that is ongoing in the territory of Ukraine, it is really important for us as for prosecutors concerning qualification of actions of uh, um, persons. Uh, for us, it is important to have uh, to have this qualification, whether it is international or not, because this influences the norms uh, we use. If it is international conflict, we have Geneva Conventions. Uh, this is the main source concerning war crimes. If we are speaking about uh, domestic legislation, this is only one article of the agreements concerning control issues, control of Russian Federation over illegal armed formations. What is this control? The control of the state over the behavior of these armed formations. This gives us grounds to say about the responsibility of the state for the actions of such illegal armed formations. If we are saying that uh, behavior of these uh, uh, armed formations equals uh, uh, the behavior of the state, uh, so this uh, um, state, Ukraine, and uh, uh, this armed formation, the conflict between them is international conflict in this case. So for us, this uh, qualification of this control is really important. We should properly identify this control of the state over illegal armed formation. Uh, factual, efficient control, uh, uh, overall control. For us, this is an issue that is really important because the main article in the criminal code, Article 438, it establishes the responsibility for violation of laws and customs of war, and it is a blanket article. It refers us to international agreements and customer, international customary law. That's why the issue of the right qualification of the armed conflict uh, and the proper qualification of actions of individuals who violate international humanitarian law for us, uh, this is important. This is uh, at the preliminary stage, and then it will be important at the next sta uh, stage of uh, uh, this uh, proceedings. Uh, I would like to say that those journalists who are hearing and uh, watching us now, they may ask questions on YouTube and through, uh, and also you may ask questions through the coordinator of the center. If we have questions from journalists, I would like to ask. Mikola, I understand that you cannot comment, but on the whole, uh, is this process important for other cases? Can it have potential influence, this decision of the Hague Court? 
can it influence other proceedings? Maybe you can have an overall assessment of this. I may say that we follow this court hearing. We participated the Office uh, of Prosecutors General of Ukraine. We participated at the lev level of pretrial investigation. Then we provided documents to competent bodies of the Netherlands. And then court started its hearing. There is a tension. We follow the influence of decisions of the court, of the Hague District Court on uh, national criminal proceedings uh, and hearings uh, that will be uh, that we will have in the in Ukraine but there won't be direct influence if we are speaking about law these are separate jurisdictions they are not connected maybe um, only um, uh, when the decision will be handed over uh, in the territory of Ukraine from the international court. Uh, so, thank you. We have three minutes. Unfortunately, we had some delays because of the technical reasons. And uh, if we have questions, uh, if you want to ask questions, we may try to... Yes, we have a question. Olga Musafirova is in the hall, and she would like to ask question. Olga, if you are there, so we are ready to take your question. Good afternoon, Olga Musafirova. A Nova Gazeta news outlet. I have a question to Mr. Chordash. And uh, about what you've said, um, so you believe that uh, Russia has more powerful lobbyists than Ukraine uh, ha has in OECE and UNO? Uh, so, uh, uh, I would like to stress that, uh, do you hear me, Maria, do you hear what I say? Uh, so, uh, uh, Maria, Maria, do you hear me? I ask quest a question. Maria, do you hear me? I can hear you. I would like to repeat my question, a question to Mr. Jordash. Uh, can we interpret this? Uh, uh, is that Russian Federation uh, in uh, UNO and in OEC is that they have better lobbyists um, because uh, um, support to Ukraine fades away, and uh, uh, um, there are many um, different opinions concerning support and how it should be done. And uh, Mr. George was present in Donbass in the zone of the military conflict. And what, uh, um, what are your impressions if you visited that territory? We thank you for your question. Let me just start by saying that um, I, I, I'm not sure that it's uh, necessarily a question of um, Russia having better lobbyists um, in relation to the UN and um, OSCE, or, although it may have. I don't. I don't know. But what I do know is that, um, or what I think is that. Um, 
Ukraine has a more difficult job, in a sense, of proving something. You know, if you, Ukraine wants to prove or establish that uh, Russia is in occupation in Crimea, that Russia is in occupation in the in Donbass, and these are complicated um, factual and legal um, uh, questions, which are not easy for an international court or a, a national court, such as um, the, the Dutch courts, as, as Marika was dis explaining. Um, you know, the, these are questions which in some ways international courts try to avoid because they're very complicated. So in that sense, um, you know, Ukraine has a more difficult job than Russia. Russia has to deny um, and, um, you know, avoid, whereas Ukraine has to confront these facts or, and confront the international law and really um, calculate and do assessments which are complicated. So that's the first thing. And I, you know, in relation to the OSCE and the UN, I mean, they, they, of course, Russia has, as a member of the Security Council, has an elevated status there. And the OSCE, of course, has um, a position of uh, neutrality. So they have to step very carefully in the sense of not um, uh, overstepping their political uh, mandate. So that's another factor, I would say, that makes it more difficult for Ukraine in those organizations than it does uh, for Russia. Now, in relation to Donbass, I, I haven't actually been into Donbass. I've been to the contact line, but not into Donbass. Um, what I would say is that uh, there is, it seems to me, there's from what I've read and from what I've uh, learned during my time in Ukraine, there is uh, very little doubt that the Russians are involved in Donbass. And I think the, the, the more complicated question is, um, to what degree are they involved and what does it mean from an international legal perspective? Um, are they directly involved in Donbass? Um, that's one question, an important question. Are they in overall control of uh, the um, armed groups there is another very important question. And it's not um, something that can be worked out by observation, it has to be worked out by careful and um, time-consuming um, analysis of um, information from information of how the state groups are, armed groups, I beg your pardon, are um, supplied, who uh, directs them, who helps them plan, um, who helps them operate overall, and only through an analysis of those types of criteria will we be able to work out precisely what Russia's involvement is and what it means in international law. If I may add to this briefly, because um, the, the Dutch prosecution in the uh, case has made, so it's, it's preliminary, so it's all, they're not making their full arguments yet, but they have said that they feel that there's sufficient evidence to close, to not have to not need more investigations into this. And they seem to indicate that uh, there is sufficient evidence that Russia has been involved to a huge, to a high extent, large extent, uh, both in the involvement in downing MH17 themselves as in the involvement with the armed groups. So it seems that their argument is, we don't need to go into it, but court, if you do want to go into this, we're ready to argue that it's an international armed conflict. Дякую, колеги. Я думаю, що нам, на жаль, потрібно вже завершувати. We have to uh, end our meeting. So I would like to thank all the speakers. This is a very difficult topic. This is difficult because here in Ukraine we consider this case taking into account our legislation. This is not evident for the world. And we know the facts that were collected by Ukrainian prosecution and civil society organizations. 
And we know that there is presence in uh, Donbass and in Crimea. We should communicate this to the world, and we should prove once again this information to the world. And we will continue our uh, um, communication, and uh, we will support uh, Ukraine at the international level. And if you would like to speak with our speakers, you may uh, do it. And uh, my contacts are in UCMC. I would like to thank our speakers. And I would like to thank uh, those uh, who watched us online. And sorry for these um, technical problems. And um, uh, thank you very much, and uh, till the next time, goodbye.